Merci, merci Kate. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, C'est un plaisir d'être ici. Uh, it's, I'm very happy to be here and special thanks to Kate and to the Institute and to your colleagues uh, for arranging this opportunity. It's, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. So when we think about cities, we uh, grown ups kind of we, 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 we're drawn towards this sort of view of the city. Um, but if we think about looking at cities from the point of view of children, um, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at streets, we're looking at uh, the immediate neighbourhoods, the houses, the spaces where children and families live. Um, and uh, the world looks different and cities look different from that point of view. And I think one of the very first things to say is that in a way children don't live in cities, children live in neighbourhoods. Um, it's those localities where they spend their everyday lives that, that, that are most significant um, and almost overriding significance for children. So um, I think when we're thinking about children today and about the way childhood is changing, uh, that one good place to start is to think about our own childhoods. Um, of course, childhood is constantly changing, uh, but we all have that resource of memories of our own childhood. So uh, my next slide, I think, helps to get into some of these questions about how childhood is changing. Um, so you can see a map here, and what you can see on this map is what you might call the home territory of, eight, of four children who are all eight years old. So it's their roaming range or their right to roam. And so, um, but they happen to be four children who are in four generations of the same family and they all grew up in the same city. So this big blob that you can see that takes up most of the map, that's the home territory, that's the roaming range of the great grandfather in this family at the age of eight. So he could travel 10 kilometers across the city on his own at the age of eight. Then you can see uh, two smaller circles, so, so the grandfather at the age of eight, and then at the top there, the mother. And then this dot here, that's the roaming range of the son in this family at the age of eight. And uh, if you've got good eyesight and good English, you will maybe see he's allowed to go to the end of his street. Uh, but that's more, you would say, license, that's more everyday freedom than most eight-year-olds get in the UK, certainly. And typically, we know from studies that at the age of eight, most children are effectively con contained, restricted to their homes and gardens if they have them. So I hope you can see how this illustrates a really fundamental and profound and I think underexplored change in the nature of childhood, what I call the shrinking of children's horizons. Um, and most of my work in one way or another is, is, is sort of reflecting on and responding to this change in children's lives. And I'm not saying that we you know, can somehow wave a magic wand and turn the clock back uh, to a time when children had that kind of freedom that you can see from the earlier generations. But I am saying that what, what's being illustrated here is part of what I would say was a good, a, a, a key ingredient of a good diet of childhood experiences. That, that ability to have a taste of freedom, to explore, to gradually find out about the people and places around you. Um, and that that ingredient is disappearing from children's lives today. And we know this is happening, this, this shrinking of children's horizons is happening across the world, um, especially in high income countries. Uh, it's happening faster in some countries than in others, but it's happening to girls and boys, uh, children from different social classes, cultural backgrounds. Um, so, if you like, my part of my rationale and my interest in this question about childhood and the built environment is about thinking about how the way we design and shape cities can begin to open up the possibilities for children and for their parents to start to get back some of that everyday freedom. Now, um, I've used the term, and Kate used the term, child-friendly urban planning or child-friendly cities. What, what do we mean by that term? 
there's a reasonably familiar use of that term, which is in the context of UNICEF and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and uh, a, a program under the banner of child-friendly cities, um, which is a strong focus on children's participation, on governance, um, and on, if you like, mapping how children's rights are addressed within the city governance structures. Um, now, I think those are admirable values, and I'm a believer in children's rights, but I think it's also true that this approach, when it comes to the built form of cities, has had very little influence. The cities are still, by and large, being built and designed and shaped with very little, if any, attention to children's needs, wishes and rights. So I think it's time for a new approach. And the approach I'm arguing for, which others uh, I think have, and I'm building on the work of others, is to really think instead about, not about children's participation, but about children's everyday experiences of living in the city. Um, and this, is, this next slide, I try to illustrate this idea of children's everyday freedoms. So you could say that a child-friendly city or a child-friendly neighbourhood is one that has, there are two dimensions. So one dimension of the physical properties is that there are lots of things to do. So there are play spaces, there is green space, uh, there are services and facilities, sports, leisure, children can meet their friends. So if you like, there is a rich offer within a neighbourhood. But that's not enough, because what you also need is that children need the ability to access, to get to those offers and opportunities. Um, and that's sometimes called children's independent mobility, this idea of you know, the age at which or the ability for children to get around neighbourhoods on their own, especially obviously as they grow up. And it's only where you have both good offers across a neighbourhood or a city and high levels of independent mobility, I would say you can call a city or a neighbourhood child-friendly. And so this is a model that's really drawn on, drawing on the work of Marketa Kitter, um, who is uh, currently, I think, Professor of Spatial Planning at Alvar Alto University in Helsinki. So that's my answer to that question. And you can see there's some resonance with, with some of the advocacy and, and the messages around child friendliness. And uh, this next quote is becoming increasingly familiar um, to those of us making this case, which is the, the mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa, talking about children being a kind of indicator species for cities. And I, I, I think that's a very uh, compelling metaphor or, or image, that in the same way that if you see salmon in a river, that's a sign of the health of that habitat. If you see children active and visible going around the city, uh, different ages, with and without their parents, that's the sign of the health of our habitats, of human habitats. So, uh, that's, I'm setting out my stall for, 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 for the conceptual, conceptualization of a child-friendly city or a neighbourhood. So why does that conception, why does that model matter? Um, and I think it matters, there are really kind of four, three or four, um, main headings that, that, that try to illustrate why this is a powerful um, framing of, of urban planning. First is, I hope, fairly obvious, those of you in the room who are working in public health, that um, child-friendly neighbourhoods are healthy neighbourhoods. They support physical activity, they support the growth and the development of children's competences, of their sense of, of, of their self-efficacy, their ability to make their way uh, both figuratively and literally um, in the world. Um, but they also, there are connections between child friendliness and, um, and child friendly neighbourhoods and sustainable neighbourhoods and environmentally positive neighbourhoods. And I think there's also clear connections between neighbourhoods that are child friendly and those that support community. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit more about each of those. Um, OK, I know many people in this room probably talking and thinking a lot about obesity. Um, child obesity, I think, is amongst other things, it, it's children telling us through their bodies that the environments they're growing up in are not healthy. And yes, there are various causal factors behind that, but I think it's clear that one of them is, is children's uh, simply having more sedentary and inactive lives. And um, 
this may or may not be news to you, but Canada is quite high up the league table of child obesity, which is not a league table you want to be at the top of. Um, I think the UK is somewhere about in the middle of that, so it's not like we're doing particularly well. Um, and what's interesting is that the public health experts um, do see children's everyday freedoms as being part of the response to this problem. So this is a quote actually from a few years ago now, but the former really head, uh, the lead on um, nutrition and physical activity in the federal uh, CDC in the United States talking about in effect spontaneous play being a kind of magic bullet for younger children. Um, and so I think that often when we hear talk of obesity we see, we see a strong focus on diet and less focus on if you like the other side of the equation. I think that's, that's a, a useful reminder to us. Um, but I don't think the connections here are just around physical health and physical activity. I think there are also connections with mental health and emotional well-being. Now this is, it's, um, I think there's emerging evidence and, and hypotheses if you like, but, but this, what this graph is showing you is a, a gradual over, again, interestingly, sort of 50, 60, 70 year time frame increase in the levels of depression amongst young people. Again, this is in the States. Um, but you can see similar trends um, from big cohort studies uh, in the UK and in some other countries. Now, it's too quick to say that this is all down to not playing outdoors or not having um, the, the chance to walk and cycle, but there is certainly some clear links there, and there are um, people within child and adolescent mental health who are making the strong case that if children are as they grow up, as they become teenagers, are to be ready to deal with the greater responsibilities um, that they face. They need to be given the chance to learn coping mechanisms to get the hang of what that wider world is like when they're younger. Um, this next, I'm a numbers person, I should say, so I, I, I'm, this, uh, I like numbers. I think that we can, we can gain insights. So this chart shows you um, it's a simple correlation between, on the one hand, the level of well-being of children in different countries, and on the other hand, measures of their independent mobility. Um, so this is drawing on, on the one hand, uh, work from UNICEF, uh, looking at index, an index of child well-being, a kind of basket of measures, and on the other axis, children's independent mobility. And you can see there's actually quite a strong correlation between those two uh, measures. Now that's correlation, not causation, as any of the social scientists in the room will tell you, but I think it's actually, it's quite a telling. And I, I, it speaks to, a, 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 or raises questions about intriguing links there. Um, so I want to move on now to the environment and sustainability, and the, the simple case I'm making here is that if we ask ourselves what a child-friendly city or a child-friendly neighbourhood looks like, and you boil it down, it's something like this. Um, and then if you ask ourselves, if we ask ourselves what a sustainable neighbourhood or a sustainable city looks like, it's pretty similar. There's not a lot of difference. Um, and the, again, what interests me is, is that framing urban planning in terms of children helps to join the dots between making places work well for children and making them more sustainable. Um, and... Uh, a lot of what this is about is about the impact and, and, and reducing the impact of the car in cities. And this is a nice quote from the um, former leader of the Project for Public Spaces uh, that I, I think is fairly self-explanatory. Okay, um, and then my third theme around why this idea matters is about community. Um, and here again, another chart, bear with me. What you're looking at here is um, some measures of activity in public space, so numbers of people out and around in a number of different housing areas. So this is an observational study of new housing areas in England. And what this study showed was that those housing areas where you had larger numbers of children out and about, that's the, this line here, are pretty closely tracked by those housing areas that had larger numbers of adults out and about. So uh, I've got the quote from the report from which this is drawn here, that children are the generators of community life, that there, there is 
if you like, this is a, 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 um, an illustration of that old line about um, t taking a village to raise a child, but also that, that um, places that work well for children work well and are actively used by adults as well. And so uh, the community connections that you see that emerge and that are expressed in public space are both around those uses by children and by adults. And I think you can kind of generalize that idea a bit. Um, and I certainly make the case uh, around um, children's <coughs> sense or s growing sense of themselves as citizens, as active people who have a claim on the community in which they live, as being partly a matter of their everyday experiences of, of neighborhoods. And this is really a, an idea that goes back at least as far as Jane Jacobs um, in The Death and Life of Great American Cities, where she has a really interesting discussion about what is it that leads people to be engaged um, citizens, engaged city dwellers who respect the rights of other people even when they don't know them, which is what we all have to do to get along in a big city. And that part of that is about our experience when we're younger of exactly that kind of give and take um, which often happens in the streets and public spaces where we live. So that's my, um, if you like, sales pitch for the idea. Um, I now want to look a little bit more ab about what's happened in different cities, but before I do that I think it's useful to just remind ourselves what children themselves say when we ask them what they want in cities. And that's, that's an um, almost universal pattern of findings that what children like on the left there and what they don't like. It doesn't matter where you are, which children you ask, those are the answers that they give. So you could say maybe the time is now right to stop asking them that question and to start taking some action. So let's move on to the cities. Um, here's, uh, oh sorry, one more point. Um, I'm shifting the lens a little bit here from child friendliness to family friendliness. They are different, but I think there's some fairly close parallels. And I'm just briefly summarizing the work of uh, Brent Todirian, who was, a, was the chief planner at Vancouver, has also worked in Calgary. And he talks about neighborhoods that work well for families have three components, three basic building blocks. Um, affordable and appropriate housing, of course. Um, appropriate services, schools, childcare, health services, and then the third plank, um, a welcoming and enjoyable public realm. And it's that third aspect that I'm really focusing on here. But these, these are interconnected for sure. Okay, here's my sort of travelogue of cities that I visited. Um, five in Europe, and then um, four in Canada. And I'm going to briefly give you a flavor in a minute of what was going on in those cities. But, but in essence, the way I chose these cities was that they weren't necessarily cities that you, you would say are child-friendly right now. That, that's not the point. The point is that these are all cities that have done some significant work to become more child-friendly, to make their built form better for children. Um, so th and, th and that work has gone beyond one or two pilot projects or a one-off engagement exercise. It, it's, it's been moving towards going to scale or taking a strategic approach. So that was the, um, if you like, the, the, um, the thinking behind why this list was the list that I ended up with. Okay, um, first up, um, Antwerp. What you're looking at here is a, a, a part of Antwerp's program to improve neighborhoods for children, is to take a kind of n a neighborhood by neighborhood analysis of both the physical spaces within that neighborhood, the outdoor spaces, playgrounds, sports facilities, and the walking and cycling networks. So you could, it's sometimes described as a play layer or a play tissue. And um, the officer who's running this program uh, does quite a lot of work with GIS and with engagement and with local services to figure out where there might be some opportunities for change. Um, which might involve improvements to the spaces, but might involve improvement to the walking and cycling networks and, and, and the mobility. And then comes up with a proposal which is, is discussed and taken forward. So it's that play layer model, I think, is a really um, 
uh, effective way to put into practice that point I made earlier about children living in neighbourhoods and about the importance of mobility as well as um, space. In Ghent, um, not far down the road from Antwerp, that play layer approach has also been taken, but it's, it's been incorporated into a, into a larger and more strategic action plan around becoming more child friendly. So there's uh, actually a team of officers um, within the municipality who are working with different departments, transport, urban planning, parks, um, on, on an action plan that's been drawn up and has identified an identified programme. And Ghent is a city that's well known in Flanders as, as being, it, it, it wears with honour a badge, if you like, that it is a child-friendly city. So this is a, a significant and well embedded and politically supported programme in Ghent. Rotterdam is coming from a different direction. Um, the work in Rotterdam started about 12 years ago when there was a survey that showed that Rotterdam was the worst city in the Netherlands to grow up. Again, not a league table that you want to be at the top of or bottom, depending on how you look at it. So the politicians in Rotterdam uh, identified improving the built form, the physical fabric of the city, as being a way to start to address that problem, which was a real problem because families were leaving the city, taking their energy and their tax base with them. So this was, I, th I think of all the cities, the most, um, the <coughs> biggest in terms of money. Um, millions of euros spent over actually two separate programs. Um, in, initially with a focus on one neighbourhood, and then in second version with a focus on, I think, eight or nine neighbourhoods. Um, but a range of interventions um, of the type that I've already talked about, improvements of public space, schoolyards, recirculation, reconfiguring traffic, um, walking and cycling, and so on. The next city I'm going to talk about is um, Oslo. And this is a rather different approach. Um, and a, a, an initiative that's had quite a lot of, of profile within urban planning, effectively using smartphones um, and a smartphone app to recruit children to be spies on their city. Um, and it, the translation on this is, uh, my Norwegian is not that great, but it's something like, um, be a spy on your city. And the idea is that children can report the problems they face getting around their neighbourhood and particularly problems on their journey to school and those reports go directly and in real time to a team within the highways department of Oslo City Council. Uh, and not only that, but that team has a budget to make changes in response to those problems. Um, so it's a really powerful tool to, in, to get children's views directly, quickly, efficiently and then do something about it. Now that might be something as simple as trimming a hedge um, that's blocking a pavement, a sidewalk, or it might be a, a, a more long-term and, and significant piece of work around um, making a junction safer or even putting in new paths and, and walkways. Um, and in Oslo, this program is strongly linked to the city's goal to reduce car traffic and to promote more sustainable modes of travel, which is a, a, a very strategic and high profile aim, not just within Oslo, but within Norway as a whole. I'm going to move to Freiburg next. Um, and this, what you can see here, is uh, an image from one new, not so new now, but a district that was built within Freiburg about starting about 20 years ago. It's called Vauban. It's well known amongst urbanists, and it's a, um, it's a, about somewhere between five and ten thousand population. So it's a big new district um, that is highly sustainable, and in practice highly child friendly. Um, very low levels of car ownership, very good levels of public transport, good walking and cycling networks, links to the wider city, um, and one of the interesting things about this district, it, it was partly. Uh, informed by a study in the 90s in Freiburg that looked at uh, children's freedom to roam, freedom to play and freedom to get around. And what, and, and, and what that study showed about the kind of neighbourhoods where children do have more freedom and that those ideas and those insights were, were put into practice with this um, 
a sort of a lighthouse project um, in that city. So it's, it's, you, you could almost say it's a kind of a near utopian model of what, what a neighbourhood looks like physically if it's very child friendly. And, and I can tell you I've been to this neighbourhood two or three times um, and you always see very high numbers of children out and about really filling, and adults, filling the whole of the public space. It's, um, it, it's quite compelling. And my last, I'm not going to run through all the cities, but just one more, and this is here in Canada, um, and the city of New Westminster that has again taken a strategic approach to becoming more child and youth friendly, um, linked that to some work around housing design, um, and that again is partly a response to this finding within that municipality that families, families were moving when they had young children to New Westminster, but when their children entered school age, they could see the population of families dropping. And they, again, the, the politicians felt that was a problem. Okay, um, I'm going to briefly summarize. Uh, I've got two diagrams for you. Um, and this is my first diagram that tries to picture the rationale. I've mentioned it a few times, but why were these different cities doing what they were doing around child-friendly urban planning? So, um, nice Venn diagram for you here, and I hope you can see that, that there are a cluster, there are three broad themes that were coming out in terms of why the decision makers were telling me that they were doing what they were doing. There's one uh, set of rationales around the economy and demography, I've already talked a bit about that. A second around sustainability and the environment, and then a third around children's rights and well-being. Um, and what you can see is most cities actually were articulating more than one of those rationales. Um, so I thought that was an, an interesting finding. That not only did, was it clear that um, cities were not just talking about children's rights, about the UN approach, but they were actively looking for links with other strategic agendas within that um, city. Now, um, my next two slides, they're not going to win any prizes for PowerPoint slide of the year competition, um, but it's just give you a flavour of the data, the hard data and information that I gathered, and also so that you can have it afterwards. So this looks at the different cities, um, and, and what, what I tried to capture was kind of what kind of resources are being allocated um, within each city on these explicitly badged programs. So you can see both, uh, if you like, officer resource and then hard cash. So that information is there for you. Um, and then this second slide picks out what I call the ingredients, the kind of different activities and processes that were, uh, that the different cities were telling me that they were up to. Um, and I'll come back to that set of ingredients a bit later on, but I do want to give you a little bit more of a flavour of the kind of physical changes that we were talking about that I was seeing when I was visiting some of these different cities. So again, um, a few just case studies, if you like. So this is, um, by the way, it was f in my European leg, it was in February. Um, uh, it was the beast from the east, was what we called it. It was um, a whole minus six degrees, everybody, um, which is... I know small beer here in Canada, but was quite a big deal in Northern Europe. So you won't see a whole lot of children and families out um, in these spaces. But this is a big regeneration project that was aimed at um, one of the poorest parts of Ghent. Um, and uh, there was a, a layer within that regeneration program around improving the public spaces, creating more child-friendly streets, uh, creating new squares, um, improving green spaces, really a, a, a quite a comprehensive approach to public realm improvements within that um, regeneration project. Uh, coming over to Canada, um, one of the interesting programs I was looking at was around cycle infrastructure. And I know here in Montreal you've got um, a, a significant investment in cycle infrastructure, but in Vancouver they're talking about all age and ability infrastructure. And this is the idea of creating cycle networks that are good enough that segregate or reduce the, the danger from traffic um, much more than just painting some lines um, down the side of a street. So in this case, what I like about this image is um, 
So this was a, a new, uh, effectively, a, a, they call it a permeable filter, a road closure, um, to uh, allow cycles through, but also has become a kind of impromptu, um, spontaneous outdoor play uh, space where I presume a family who lived nearby just stuck the basketball net out um, that was being used when I was cycling by. Um, turning to Oslo, this is a practical demonstration of that approach I talked about with the traffic agent where uh, what was going on here was a new, um, a, a new arrangements about school intake. So there was a problem where a bunch of children were going to be going on a different journey to school and the app identified the need for a new path to be built. So you can see a kind of before and after image where this new footpath was created to provide a more direct link between one residential area and the school that the children were going to. Uh, and this is a, uh, almost a kind of emblematic interven intervention in, in Rotterdam where a car park uh, was converted into a, 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 play a playful public space. Um, I quite like the propaganda value there, but it also, you know, in, in many cities are actually seeing falling levels of car ownership and car use. Um, so that then raises some interesting possibilities about what else you can do with the space. So, what difference did all this make? Um, here's a quote from uh, Mayor Jonathan Cote, who is in fact re-elected Mayor of New, of New Westminster, um, who basically says, yes, we have achieved our goal, we seem to be achieving our goal of keeping families with school-aged children staying in our um, municipality. In other parts of Vancouver you're seeing school-aged families moving out of the urban areas, but in New Westminster you're seeing the reverse trend. Uh, a second quote, this is actually is not from a politician, but from a, a, um, a researcher in the Norwegian government, but who's been looking at child-friendly interventions and initiatives um, and what she's saying here, which I think is really um, goes to some of the bigger picture questions, is, is that thinking about child friendliness is a way of winning people over to some progressive and sustainable um, urban planning issues. And um, just briefly, I think one of the challenges with urban planning is that cities are incredibly complicated. They're complex beasts. Um, They've been described as a wicked problem. In that it's almost, you don't know where you start, there are different worldviews, um, there are all sorts of kinds of interventions. Um, they're highly, most of those interventions leave winners and losers. So how do you find a way through that complex policy environment? And I think what um, Gro Hansen is pointing at is that bringing children into the debate helps to clarify and get a handle on some of these wicked problems. Um, and helps to uh, get voters and decision makers to kind of lift their eyes above the mess and the, 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 the immediate challenges and looked more towards the longer term goals and progressive goals for cities. So my second diagram, and actually if there's one slide I want you to kind of ingrain in your memory and come back to, it's this one. So this is my recipe, if you like. I took some of those ingredients I talked about earlier, and my recipe for a child-friendly urban planning and design program in a city, um, based on what was emerging and, and coming back to me from the cities I was visiting, and also what, what seemed to make sense to me. And at the heart of this hub-and-spoke model is an official an engaged, effective, um, well-supported officer within the municipality who can get things to happen. And, and then the different uh, aspects around that person, ideally supported by a politician as well, not always, but that clearly helps, um, are five other ingredients. So investment in spaces, parks, play spaces, and in mobility, streets, walking networks. Secondly, meaningful engagement with children. I could talk a lot about that, but in, I'm pointing at the problem that sometimes you do see engagement work with children, but it's, it's kind of tokenistic. It's like it's, it's an idle wheel, and that's not what really helps in this situation. I've said it before, a focus on residential neighbourhoods, um, strong links with those departments and policies and programmes that actually make a difference physically 
within a city. And then the last, and actually the, the ingredient that's hardest to find in cities, some kind of measures of progress. Um, there are a few cities that had that, and I think that more is needed. Because you know, if you're making a political case for this, you need to be able to show the difference that you make. So that's my uh, recipe. Um, I'm just going to close with a few slides. Um, firstly, sharing a few cities that I, ha what I was not able to look at, but I think are doing some interesting projects, and then a few reflections and lessons. So, um, this is one city that I'm hoping to visit, um, and one initiative which you'll find about all over the internet, um, and it's a, uh, in Barcelona where the um, city has tried piloting some quite um, radical transport or traffic flow changes. So effectively what used to be a standard grid of the kind that you're familiar here with in North America, you, you effectively eliminate traffic from the center of, those, of, of that um, block and instantly create uh, new public space that can be used in all sorts of different ways. So there's a, a couple of pilots I think running um, but because of the built form of that city, it has the potential to be a scalable intervention. And then a second um, initiative that I just wanted to share with you is around schoolyards in Paris. And the mayor of Paris has declared her intention to convert all of the city's schoolyards into a publicly accessible green spaces, um, which they're certainly not currently. And that's partly a response to climate change and her... Um, and that recognition that one of the things that helps with city resilience, particularly around heat um, and also flooding, is increasing the level of green cover. Um, so I thought that was an interesting, another example of the sort of win-win. So there's a bunch of other cities that I could talk about. I also just want to quickly signpost a new resource that's just come out from UNICEF uh, within the last month um, that's giving practical advice on this um, on guidance for cities. A few challenges. Um, time is short, so I'm not going to dwell on them. Um, but you can see some here. Questions about <coughs> gentrification. One of the challenges here, and you, they certainly see this in some cities, that as neighbourhoods become more child-friendly, they become more desirable because guess what? Everybody likes them. So then you have problems around rising rents and um, you know the forces of gentrification. There are questions around legislation. What what sort of national legislation might be needed or helpful? I think. In terms of age, there are questions and unanswered questions around both a focus on teenagers, which can sometimes be missing within this program, and also really young children, um, under fives and their caregivers. And there's some good work going on by the Bernard Van Leer Foundation, who are one of my clients, um, on that question. And the last one I just put up here, re relevant of course to this part of the world, um, and the picture I've just dropped in, uh, what you are looking at here is the car park in the city hall offices in Reykjavik. And so when I was in Reykjavik a few years ago, every Friday night, the car park became a free and kind of open invitation sort of roller disco space. So I thought that was a really smart, low cost, generous um, offer to children and families and actually anybody who wants to put on a pair of skates um, in that city. Um, really nice um, idea. Um, I think this is my penultimate slide. Neighbourhoods first, I've talked about that, player mobility, um, win-wins, connections between child friendliness and other strategic challenges facing cities. This point, people before policies, that goes back to my point about this, this key hub officer within a city. Again and again I found that that was what was happening. It was one person who started the ball rolling. And then, yes, policies often came later, but it was their ability to shine a light on this issue and to start getting some work and some programs happening that was crucial. Um, and this last point, this is a kind of move towards the language of planners and built environment professionals that, that maybe you know, we need to be talking in using these chunky words like infrastructure to get their attention. And um, the book that you can see there is, is, is where that phrase children's infrastructure has been, has been um, 
uh, shared. Uh, so that's a report by Arup, the big global planning consultancy, looking at designing for urban childhoods. So I, I hope that's given you a flavour of, of why, what I did, why I did, and what I found. And there's one final lesson that I want to share with you, which is really um, when we look at cities and, and, and countries and our, for our inspiration, many of us look at the Dutch and what has happened in the Netherlands. Um, but actually, there's an interesting lesson about the Netherlands. And it's not the lesson you might think. It's the, the Dutch are... It's, the good things that are happening in the Netherlands are not just because they're naturally child-friendly and they have a friendly culture. There were real battles going on in the streets of the Netherlands, particularly back in the 70s, about who streets were for. Um, and you can see that image uh, illustrating this. So I think partly why the reason why and the lesson from the Netherlands about child-friendly cities is that they raised questions about spatial justice, yes, about who has a claim on the spaces within cities. And I think the lesson for us in the rest of the world is that we also need to be asking hard questions about who has a claim on space and why and how things need to change. Thank you very much. Merci.